Welcome to Alex Flight Deck, podcast dedicated to Montreal Alex football, presented by Sport Buff. I'm your host, Tim Capper. Along with Cliffy D. So, neither of us had turkey gasp. No, neither of us, neither of us had stuffing gasp. So we aren't really that full, but we're still our bellies are still full. But you you had you had, some, you had a nice post game dinner. So are you <laughs> sufficiently saponsified and ready to talk about this very oh. interesting and potentially season changing game versus the Ottawa Red Blacks? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we yeah, I, I think we've got so much to talk about that. Uh, yeah, I, I'm ready. I'm focused. Let's let's do this. Let's let's dive right in. Yeah. Now and also a little bit later on, we were very happy. Uh, to have uh, uh, the Alouettes French broadcast partner David Arsenault will be joining us a little bit later. Um, great conversation with him about uh, his history with the uh, with the RDS and broadcasting the Alouettes. So stay tuned for that. So uh, wow, again, I, I I don't know where to start. I mean, obviously Alouettes win. That's the main thing uh, that we are you know, that we're going to be talking about is because with the Alouettes knocking off the Red Blacks, we don't go, we don't go for a tie for last. Uh, we're after, after what happened in, in Hamilton, we're now in second place in the East. Wait, what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, with that uh, 20 to 16 win of ours. Um, yeah. Uh, but there's just still so much to unpack with this because VA Vernon Adams goes down right before the uh the the Matthew Schiltz I guess drive to uh to to get us over that hump and put away the pesky uh Ottawa Red Blacks he gets hurt and we weren't sure what he was down with we now know um with a uh a, a fractured left shoulder which is a non throwing and I will admit Cliff it was very weird cuz I you know after I left you and I was heading home you know I usually head down the stairs but I went down the the the, the side entrance where to, mm-hmm. to leave, and they were wheeling VA into the uh, into the ambulance, and that was that was tough to see. But like the good fan I am, I screamed, said loudly, "We love you, VA!" and everybody was everybody chimed in. So yeah, no, that's it's tough to think about. It's it, it was tough to watch, uh, especially too. Like I mean, he's. Vernon's been dealing with all all kinds of injury related things. Let's not forget uh, three weeks ago, mm-hmm. you know, he, he had the, this issue with his ribs all of a sudden that uh, affected him when he was playing against the Argonauts. Uh, then the Saturday before this, or I guess it was last Saturday, technically uh, against Hamilton, uh, he hurt his ankle and we thought, okay, he was done for the day then, but somehow managed to come back into the game and win the whole damn thing. Yeah. Uh, then he also took a, a, a tremendous lick from Abdul Kenna in, in the in the third quarter. Uh, completely BS call, as far as I'm concerned, to not throw the flag on him. That's was a BS no call. Now, and, yeah. and you know, people are people are gonna probably say, uh, Tim and Cliff, you guys are homers. For us to go off, for Coach Kahari to go off as he did, for Tiasen to have to blur out his <laughs> his, his <Yeah>. words. <laughs> Yeah, the, the I don't think TSN has a lunatic of their own to use on uh, on Coach Kahari, but uh, trust <laughs> me, I'm, I'm be, fr- that would I'm, be hilarious. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, it would be pretty hilarious. That would be but, pretty funny. Uh, I, I'm f- fairly safe to say, and Kahari, you know, he's a very happy-go-lucky, very chill dude. But I mean, that he was hot, hot as a pistol mm-hmm. at that. And don't blame him. Don't blame him at all. Like, he there was definitely some f bombs dropped for sure. Oh, and sure. Like we, you and I, we were beside ourselves, and just about everybody around it. Like, what the hell? Like, yeah, no flag. And that's the thing. Like, the hit was bad enough, but then you don't throw a flag on it. Yeah, like that uh, ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Like, and at, as of taping this, the we don't know if there's going to be any ramifications for the Ottawa player for that that hit. Um, I guess. Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you. If yeah. if there's no max fine for a shot like that. The, something is terribly, terribly wrong with the system. You got guys like Najee Murray who get uh, who get fined for a tourist hit against uh, Jeremiah Masoli mm-hmm. the week before. Mm-hmm. And okay, fine. You know what? I, I I look at him like that was dumb. That was that was dumb. Like I, I can tell he was trying to play the ball and maybe kind of decided at the last minute. Oh, maybe I don't want to be a part of this. And lo and behold, you know, it's not easy. You can't always stop on a dime like that. And okay, fine. 
hit happens, you know, you, you take a you take a hit in the wallet as well. Okay, you live and learn. But that that was practically blatant. I mean, oh yeah, he, don't don't he was head hunting. There's no question. Yeah, he was head yeah. Hunting. Don't give me the crap. You've already started. Yeah, you've already started. You knew exactly what you were going to do. Yeah. So yeah, and I, I and I also have to take umbrage. Uh, you know, we love David Sanchez. Mm-hmm. You know, that's our guy. But during the the on the TSN panel uh, during the uh, Hamilton auto, uh, Toronto game. He was kind of insinuating that, you know, maybe Vernon was a little bit late with the slide, like kind of victim blaming a little bit here. Oh, and garbage. I, no, no, I'm sorry. Like the rules that are in place right now are meant to protect the quarterbacks. This is a quarterback driven league. And I'm sorry, but a light slide, like even if that were the case, which I again, I looked at the play a couple of times and I I didn't see it was like it was obviously as a quarterback, as a competitor, a guy like Vernon is going to try and get as many yards as possible. But you see him sliding. He's in the act of sliding when Kenny comes in and lowers the boom on him. Mm-hmm. So I, I just don't see where you can put any fault towards Vernon Adams for that for that shot that he took. Yeah. There's just no way. And I get it. For, uh, Davis is a defensive guy. He, you know, he's, you know, one of the best quarterbacks that ever played in this league. But uh, for him to come out and say that, I, 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 that that didn't sit right with me. I mean. Davis is my guy 100%, but that that comment and that moment, and if you want to call me a homer for saying that, then fine, but really, truly, like that, no. No, his no, comment, I, was, I bunk. His comment was bunk. His comment was bunk. It really was. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, we saw, I, I, I don't want to, yeah, yeah, anyways. <laughs> Hey, you know well, what? In any event, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what the Wheel of Justice happens, uh, you know, when uh, the CFL doles out their fines. And I, I sincerely hope Abdul Canada is a little bit lighter in the pocket tomorrow. Yeah, hopefully. That's well, all I got to say. Stay stay apprised on our social media, the What's FL Deck, for more information. Hopefully we have some good news. <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's go your, back in time. Your mileage may vary. <laughs> I know. Yeah, let's go back in time a little bit. Uh, we got to talk about the, the beginning. I mean, actually, this is my first time to ask you, how is your... Um, because you're with your your significant other. How was your experience getting into the stadium with the vaccination passport? Because you were there a little bit later than I was. Mine was my my experience was basically the same as it was last time. How was your experience? Slow as molasses. I gotta be honest with you. I mean, it to me like I think they could have like I understand like they've you got to check the pass the vaccine passport. You got to pr- show your ID to show that you are who your your phone says you are. And then you guys, you know, then you got to get your, your frisk to make sure that you're, you know, don't have any uh, illegal weapons or anything like that on your person. Mm-hmm. And then you finally scan your ticket to go inside the stadium. The way they had it set up was just slow as hell. I mean, By I way, where'd you come in? On uh, on Pine Avenue. Oh, okay. Uh, the the main entrance. The main entrance. Okay, that's what I was. That was yeah. Okay, continue. I say it just felt like there was just was, I can't even call it a march because I mean it was just a. Like, like a turtle going through molasses kind of thing. It was just slow. Everybody was just moving very slowly. Like it was just, uh, like I said, it, it just felt like the system maybe was overwhelmed or what, but uh, it took a long ass time just to get up those stairs and into the stadium. Once you're in, it's all good. But yeah. uh, I don't know if there's another way of streamlining things as far as uh, like maybe doing like some of the searching and everything like that. Like, you know, the, the back, like the passport check and the search do all that sort of at the, the base of the stairs before you go up. So at least that at that point, if there's a problem or anything, then they can sort of whisk you off to the side a little bit easier. And then everybody who's good to go, they can make their way up the stairs a lot faster. They get your ticket scanned. To me, I think that would have made a lot more sense as opposed to how they did. It almost felt like everything was kind of bunched up in front. Thank you. It's almost like it wasn't on the on, we're on mine. I agree with you. Yeah. Like space like, it get, out. Like, space it out a little bit. Yeah. And again, you knew all these people were coming to the game. Like it, 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 it couldn't have been a surprise. Well, then again, also, people are not really because you know, when I got there, I was there 1145. So, th- so officially about 15 minutes after I was supposed to come in, originally supposed to, they asked me to come in. Not everybody seems to be doing that. And that, that's, you know, that's the big joke in social media that what that, you know, that was going to happen. And it, and it, I guess two games in a row, it's, ha- <laughs> it's happened. So, yeah. well, that's it. That's, you know, I, I get it. Maybe even some people may have decided last minute that they were going to go to the game and then that kind of affected things. But who's to say, I mean, the end day, once you get in, it's all good. But at the same time, it's the like when this getting there is not half the fun, as, as they say. It's 
yeah, I, I get it. It's important. Uh, it's you know, you, you definitely have to follow the protocols and understand that the team has to do everything they can to make sure that everybody gets in safely and and has everything in order. It's just it could have been spaced out a little bit better. It could have been streamlined a little bit better, as far as I'm concerned. That that's pretty much how I felt about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, then to the fun part. Dude, I we I, I I saw less complaining this year actually on social media because I look for it. I don't know if you did, but man, the CF that that single CF eighteen, holy Ooh. crap! Oh, oh, oh. man, oh. something to get you hyped for the game that is genuinely uh goosebump inducing, hype inducing. That's it. Yep. Yep. yep I mean, that's... it just oh. After that, you, you just want to run through a brick wall. It's you're like, let's go, yeah. let's effing go. Yeah. Like, and then they circle around and do it one more time mm-hmm. just before just before kickoff. Yes, yes. Oof. I mean, yeah, it's so much fun. And no, uh, thankfully, or maybe, granted, I wasn't looking for it, but no, I didn't see as many pearl clutching, uh, you know, panicky Pete's worried about, uh, you know, think of the children. No, I didn't see any of that online or anything like that. Yeah, it, I'm sure. I'm sure there was, there was, but I I honestly didn't see any complaints I tried, yeah. or anything. I tried to look something. I saw one person who was saying the guy was like, "Yeah, you, you should know. You should know better, uh, Royal Canadian Air, Air Force. You, you should you should know better." I was, I was like, "What?" Mm. You know, it was. You know, the good thing is that the Alouettes promoted it, uh, both in English and French media promoted it. It was done on social media. So again, shut up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much i mean like it's so the, much fun dude i mean why do you think why do you think people love it during the playoffs and a gray cup exactly and other places do it too who, who was it uh it wasn't it done it was done i think for the same thing for for uh armed forces day also i think what, what it was done yeah military appreciation yeah, was it, it winnipeg that did it or was it in regina they did it uh, they did it this uh, year i remember seeing it on tv so yeah it was yeah, it was one of the, yeah, one of the But it wasn't cities. a jet, though. It wasn't, it wasn't a jet, was it? You know, it was a helicopters. I think so. Yeah, we got So the, maybe we not, got, we not got, quite as loud, but I mean, like, it's we, still, we got the better, come on. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, no, it's just a, a nice salute because let's not forget, you know, Alouettes actually comes from the uh, 425 squadron out in uh, Bagoville, mm-hmm. which is, again, named after, well, out, like, they were called the Alouettes, which yeah. is what this football team is named after. So to me, I don't. I, I can't think of a much better tribute than that. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, and then the beginning, and this is something that I've already reached out to Steve Daniel about. You know, the CFL's stat guru. Um, you know, Al's defer. But then something that in the years that I have been watching Alouette's football, I think this is something I don't think I've ever seen before. The first drive for Ottawa was a two and out. Okay, what you know? What's the big deal about that? It was both sacks. Oh yeah, and then on top of that, when they got the ball back after Montreal scored on that on that first drive, which we'll talk about, th- the next pass play was a sack. So the first three pass plays attempted were all sacks. Mm-hmm. So we're I'm, you know I'm trying to figure out if that's ever ever occurred in CFL history. So well, if I get anything, I'll put it out on social. But no, but, and uh, I give props to the Elvis for setting the mood both on oh, offense yes. and on defense. Yeah, and that's what you got to do. Like you got to take it to teams like this. So you got to set the tone right away. And that's what they were trying to do. I mean, especially to against a rookie quarterback mm-hmm. who had his cage rattled uh, the week before, or actually a few days ago. Or I should say, Five days because, prior. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I said, uh, the Red Blacks right now, they're kind of in the, the midst of a uh, three games in 10 days kind of thing. And it's tough. I, I, I agree. It's tough, but you know, Montreal can't show mercy for something like that. And they didn't like that for a series. Like Patrick levels, Jamel Davis, both back to back sacks and they just put the wood to them. Mm hmm. And again, just set the tone right away. And you could tell everybody was hyped. Everybody was excited. Like, okay, here we go. Mm-hmm. This is football. Yep. Yep. And, and then the Owls get the ball. Get, get the ball. I mean, the pass to Gino. Uh, I mean, that, again, you set the tone right away. VA just slinging it right off the bat. Yep. Unbelievable. Yep. And and then, uh, then touchdown Jake just being open i was like where the hell what the hell is going on because i think there were, were there two alouettes open on that play there were but like i mean jake was on an island he was all by himself i mean like wait what like hello defense like <laughs> yeah 
I mean, you're not going to score a much easier touchdown than that if you're Jake Winecki. Like, that was just, okay, yeah. e- easy peasy. Yeah, help, you know, 32, 32 to Geno, 24 to uh, Artis Payne. What a way yeah. to start off his Alouette's career yeah, uh, as a replaced, starter, his first start. Yeah, replacing William Stanbeck and uh, just, yeah, right off the hop, just to, just to let you know that, yeah, this guy, he's been raring to go, and this was his opportunity to show that he belongs. And sure enough, you, when your first play, your very first play in the Canadian Football League is a 24-yard scamper to get into the, the red zone, mm-hmm. man, it doesn't get much better than that. Yeah. Now, Al score, up 7 nothing. And I didn't ask you this then. I'm, I'm going to ask you it now. Did you think that the Alouettes were about to blow Ottawa out of the water? Because it seemed it so easy, that first drive. If, if you were to go strictly by those first two series, I could see why a lot of people would think that. Mm-hmm. My whole thought was Ottawa had to see exactly what happened to them when they got pasted 51-29 to 29 in Ottawa. Yeah. And the there have been some changes, men. too, in their, in their roster also since that last game, too. So, exactly. I mean, like, Dominique Davis wasn't playing quarterback. Matt Nichols wasn't playing quarterback. I mean, the Alouettes had the game plan for this particular group as opposed to the guys they played last time. Ottawa was playing this effectively the same team that they were playing, you know, back on Labor Day weekend. So I had a feeling that they would I, – I, well, one would hope anyways that they were able to game plan a little bit better and be a little bit more ready for the onslaught that could have been coming. But, I mean, just – if you were to go based on that series, I could see the potential for a blowout, but – I had a feeling that Ottawa was going to be a little bit more prepared this time around. Did you expect the Alouettes to be just so docile after that fact? Because they were. <laughs> I mean, sure I were. mean, they don't <laughs> score another point, and and you know, Ottawa's up. Ottawa's up at halftime, eight seven. Yep, and just chipping away, chipping away. That's what it was. Was Lewis Ward field goal? Well, Lewis Ward field goal. Joseph Zima conceding a safety. Mm-hmm. And just like that, Otto was in the lead. I mean, yeah, it was eight to seven at the half. But uh, and you you talk about like a defensive battle. And yes, for the most part, this was like both defenses definitely came to play in the first half. And offense was just not happening. I mean, they, they were able to move the ball. I mean, they, they made a couple of nice plays to move the ball, but just couldn't do anything more than field goals. And it was surprising. I, I mean, and yeah, it just felt like uh, for that first half after that first series, the Alouettes kind of just went on autopilot mm-hmm. yeah. and just kind of coasting by and just, you know, hope that's enough to do it. Like, which can be very no, frustrating <laughs> again. To me, it was, can be very frustrating considering that we saw what happened, you know, that first drive and what happened prior, obviously. Um, but I, I will, I will admit, I mean, looking at what, how it ended up being and how the Alouettes ended up coming away with this win, you know, even though a lot of it was patchwork by other players in other places this week, and it was a ton of other players in other places, mm-hmm. the O line did still did an amazing job. Even though both, you know, that both Stanback and Artis Payne are completely two different types of running backs. Big time. I mean, you got a, a bruising tailback like what uh, Stanback is, and I find at Cameron Artis Payne, he's got a little bit of that bruiser in him, but he's much more of a especially a on that last touchdown, dude. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, again, you can tell that they both have the NFL style running, and it's great. I mean, like the, you know, they're they're definitely athletes. They're definitely guys that can move the ball and move the chains. But uh, yeah, you you really can't compare the two. Uh, they're similar in, in a lot of ways, but. Uh, I think they're just their own kind of style, like 1A, 1B, and not a bad thing. I mean, like no. so Cameron Artis Payne ended up having himself a heck of a debut for the Alouettes this past Monday. Uh, definitely racked up the yards, got that, uh, <laughs> that game-clinching touchdown in the end. It was, mm-hmm. you know, and, 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 definitely- and it was consistent. I was afraid that the Alouettes were going to, you know, uh, waste another great, I mean, I mean, crap. I mean, Artis Payne got 21 carries, man. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's and, and I like that they didn't get away from, get away from it at all. I mean, I know VA d- was just so so before he got hurt. I mean, he was twelve of twenty one for one hundred and fifty seven yards. Again, a pick which, to be honest, even though it was thrown, it should not have been thrown. It was still an amazing. <laughs> it was an amazing interception by the Ottawa defender. I mean, wow. Yeah, he had that toe drag swag, and that's oh. what made it. That's what hell made it stand up because. Again, it's like he, he caught it out of bounds. Yeah, but no, he he had just enough presence of mind to just drag those toes just enough so you can see the little pellets fly up. So like, mm-hmm. okay, yeah, he was in bounds. Damn it! Exactly. <laughs> I mean, 
yeah. Artist what, Payne. What, what, what are you going to do? <laughs> no, Artist Payne, 122 yards. Average 5.8, which is which is pretty damn good in my opinion. Uh, VA had 41 because he had a, he had some nice scampers himself. He had a 20 yard scamper. That's what uh, he does. And then Schiltz, he had that 17 yard that, that 17 yard run himself, which helped set up that set up that last touchdown. Mm-hmm. So you know, again, it's less than 200 yard passing, but yet you had guys really step up. I mean, if you look at the a lot of these guys, their longest y- catches were they, they were all almost all over 20 yards. But they were they were there and they needed to be, you know. Artist painted well. He he was he was perfect. He was a perfect four for four in yep. receiving, you know, targets to receptions. You know, BJ clutch, clutch. As BJ always. was clutch in that fourth quarter, and you know, Gino was was semi quiet in the second half. Yeah, first half he was outstanding. Uh, they, you know, obviously building off the momentum from the the win in Hamilton, where he had those two absolutely incredible catches that he had. And then kind of got quiet in the second half. Mm-hmm. And obviously, we I had get. to got at least mention for Ottawa. I mean, Caleb Evans, you know, 125 yards, had an interception, a beautiful pick, too, by the way, on our case. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he also was able to chime in with 64 yards rushing. And then what may be Ottawa's new starting running back is, uh, is to Lance Turner. So, yeah, he, he had himself a game for sure. Yeah. I mean, and it, once again, it just felt like the tackling wasn't there for the Alouettes on defense. Like, especially yeah. when Turner, he was able to, like, you know, cut on a dime, too, mm-hmm. and be able to make to make some moves and just end up making other guys looking foolish. And I'm like, oh, geez, like, it's just, it's tough. But, yeah. Now, a question I'm going to ask you about in a couple of minutes here, but in your opinion, besides VA, how will Alouettes come away um, personnel-wise? Because we, we've already seen the... The transactions, which we'll mention, transactions, and then the uh, the practice report. What are your thoughts on how the Alouettes are going into this game versus versus Ottawa, without getting too much into the preview? Well, it's going to be so different. Even though the game was only a, like last time they played each other was a couple of days ago, <laughs> it's going to be a completely different team, just like that. I mean, now you've got Matthew Schultz that's going to be the starting quarterback, and believe me, I have all of the faith in the world in him. I think he. He has proved he proved himself with that 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 game winning drive. Yeah, to to go in cold essentially. Yeah, yeah. And when his team needed him the most, and honestly, I think a lot of us would have been happy if he just managed to get the Alouettes into field goal range to go for the tie and play for overtime. Can, given the circumstances, of everything that had happened, but I think Schultz looked at that situation is like, nah, no, you know what, I got this, and I, that his demeanor, everything about him said that like he looked like a leader in that in that drive mm-hmm. like he got he got the first down that he needed to to extend the series connected with bj uh, i mean just guy on julian grant the the pass he threw she'll see through that pass pretty much across the field yeah. to kai on julian grant just to, to move the chains and then you, you i think just the way he ran the ball too which nobody expected but because we don't expect Matt Schiltz to be necessarily a mobile quarterback, at least not compared to Vernon Adams. But the guy's got legs. The guy's got wheels. And he was able to 17 yards. His one rush was for 17 yards to get the Alouettes well into the red zone. Unbelievable. Like, just poise. The poise that this kid has is remarkable. And he's been he, he, he's been with the Alouettes now for five years. I know. And he's just all... Every opportunity he's ever gotten before has just been when the team was in dire straits and, you know, people weren't expecting much out of him. And in this instance, like, I think he had he had to know that he this was his opportunity. Like he came, he came he went into the game last week against Hamilton when VA had the ankle injury and he looked fine. In fact, I was actually very impressed. Like he had yeah. a couple of nice shots that, uh, you know, was able to move the ball. Well, all things considered even though he was put into kind of a kind of like thrown into the fire a little bit, but I thought he responded well. And I thought he definitely deserved a chance to prove himself in the second half. Didn't get that because VA came back into the game and we all know how that ends. Right. That's fine. But I think just that little bit that he played in Hamilton really inspired him. I think it really gave him motivation. It's like, you know what? No, no, no. I don't want to just go for the tie. I just don't want to, you know, hope for the bet. Like I want to win this effing game. And that's what he did. Like, just like what Vernon does each and every week, Schiltzy put this team on his back and he's like, I got this. Let's go. 
And yeah. with that run, like that 17 yard run, that was him saying, we've got this. I am going to bring you guys to the promised land. Come with me. And he did. And then next series or the next, uh, next play hands off to Cameron Nardis Payne. He rumbles right in for the touchdown and, the place explodes. Oh yeah! If you haven't seen on social media, the, the Al's put put out a, um, yeah, a POV perspective of of what it was like after when they scored the touchdown. Uh, you know, it, we were only fifteen thousand, but still, that place just erupted, erupted. Yeah, I mean that was the no, like that restored the roar of the crowd. I mean that that and that's what it was was just everybody was just hyped. I was just mm-hmm. excited. I mean. Once again, it was 2019 again. It was the cardiac kids. It was everything that, you know, it's not good for the heart to have games like this. But my God, is it exciting when it works, when everything comes together and the Alouettes are able to take the lead. Unbelievable. Yeah. And to, yeah. to me, like, that's that's what it's all about is that's is just get the win. That's what you got to do is just play to win. And that's exactly what Matthew Schiltz did. And I couldn't be more proud of the guy. Like the guy, he did it. He damn near, he did the whole thing essentially. Like he, he did what he had to do. They always talk about stay ready mm-hmm. when your time comes, and that's what it was. And that's why I wasn't worried. I'm like, okay, she'll see. He's got this. He'll figure it out. Yeah, I've never, I, I've never been worried when Schultz has come in. I never have been. You know, there we've had others, other backups who are like, oh God, you know, what's going to happen to the team? And I think what's funny too, Cliff, and I don't know if this is a good analogy or not, or maybe I'm curious to know what you think of this. What's, you know, when I think of you, t- and you reminded me of how long Schiltz has been with us. He kind of, he, Schiltz is less known than Adrian McPherson was. And A.D. Mack was here, I think, just as long as Schiltz has, and he had more reps. He's had more reps than, than Schiltz has. Mm-hmm. I think because Schiltz this week, it'll be his third Third start or fourth start overall? I'd have to look it up. Fourth start. Fourth start. Yeah. Because don't forget, he started a game last year, uh, or sorry, last season. Yeah. Out in, that, out in BC Place. Yeah, no, that I remember. Uh, yeah. it, it, it'll only be his third start. Uh, see. I'm looking here. I see 2017, uh, 2019. Maybe I am missing one. But okay, he, play, no, he, play, right. he played in Hamilton in 2017. He started. That's right. That's right. So, yeah. So, okay, sorry. Three starts. I could be so, wrong. But, I could be wrong. Well, I'll double check the... but. But in any event, like he's in a much better position now than he was for those other those previous starts. Right. Although I will say, like the the game he played in Vancouver in 2019 was a very winnable game, and he had it really. I mean, he it, the reason the Alouettes he was not the reason the Alouettes lost that game. No, no, like, I like, remember. By and large, he, he did what he had to do. He put the team in position to win. It was just other factors that we won't get into. We've already talked about it. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Hundred years ago. So yeah. I mean, we won't into that. But I. From what we saw of that game alone, you knew that Matt Schiltz can play football in this league. Yep. And he's come through in the clutch when you need him to. And that's exactly what he did on Monday. And based on those factors alone, I feel extremely confident in him being able to go into Ottawa and he'll take care of business. Yep. I, I definitely have all the faith in the world that he's going to go in and he's going to do exactly what he has done before. is just put the team on his back and will them to victory. That's just the kind of player he is just like VA. Like he, he's, he's, he's going to do the thing. Yeah. I, I, have, I have all the confidence in him. Oh, same. By the way, uh, AD Mac, Adrian McPherson had five starts in his Alouette's career. Mm. So, well, again, we were so the only time we'd ever really truly see Adrian McPherson is either the Alouettes were up by 40 and it was just padding stats at that point, or the Alouettes were like 15 and three, for example, you know, and <laughs> they, they'd sewn up first place at the end of September and it's like okay, let's let's give uh, AD back a few uh, few stars. Get, let's give him some reps, kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. More than just the the third uh, third down gamble quarterback. Right. So yeah, um, a lot more to talk about when we come back from our interview uh, with David Arsenal from RDS. Um, it, practice rod the the injury report, the people we've signed. It's all very interesting as the Alouettes. The four and four Alouettes are making the drive to the playoffs. So, uh, again, uh, we're going to talk to David right now. And uh, when we get back, uh, we'll we'll continue with the show. And with us this week is a gentleman who is with the Alouettes French language broadcast team and has also had a, uh, a, a little bit of a love with something that I love, too, which happens to be stats. So he's already in my good graces. From RDS, <laughs> it is David Arsenault. David, thanks for joining us, sir. 
My pleasure. I, I'm very happy to be your guest. Um, I wanted to ask you now one thing recently that I saw. Uh, RDS did a, a great package recently. I think it was a two-part series on the Alouettes. And I think most people, most people aren't remembering, uh, if for, especially for 2021, is this is the 25th anniversary of the Alouettes coming back to the city. And you were involved yep. in, I think, a, either I think one or both parts of that uh, that a mini documentary that they did. Um, mm-hmm. for, first, how long have you been broadcasting uh, with RDS and specifically for the Alouettes? Well, since their return in 1996, mm-hmm. I was a young reporter at the time. I was uh, I was hired by RDS in January of 1996, and a few weeks or a few months after that, we learned that the Alouettes would be back in Montreal, that the Stallions would move to Montreal. So I remember that one of my bosses told me, would you like to cover this team? And I said, first, I don't know much about football. And second, my English is not very good because I grew up in Repentigny, which is in the eastern part of the uh, island of Montreal. Mm-hmm. So my English was was okay, but I did learn it through watching the prices right and hockey night in Canada and stuff like that, that that was it. So, and uh, my boss said, don't worry. It's going to be a small beat. It's not as big as the Expos or the Montreal Canadiens. So you will be able to uh, follow the team and learn your job. So that was a great, uh, great confidence coming from my, from my bosses. And so I, I started on the beat in 96. I covered, I do remember the, the first training camp, uh, and uh, after that, uh, that was a, a crazy first season because they they experienced financial problems as soon as the fourth or fifth game of the season. Mm-hmm. And I was dealing with James Piros, the owner at the time, and Bob Price was the head coach. And uh, Jim Pop, of course, was the general manager. So uh, I started in 96. The first year I didn't work on the broadcast team. There was a, another guy on the sidelines named Denis Caron. He lasted for one year, and the year after, in 97, RDS told me, uh, listen, if you want to do it also on the sidelines during the broadcast, uh, just do it. So I said, of course, I, I want to do it. So I was covering the team on a daily basis. I was also on the sidelines, so doing the same job as Didier Mijus does now for RDS. So uh, that was such a great thrill for me to be around a professional team because, like I said, I was, I was young. I was... 23. Mm-hmm. Uh, I finished my uh, my studying in, in, in Jonquière at the CJEP, what, maybe two years before only. So it was like a dream come true. It, I, was, I was so lucky to be there. I was so lucky to meet professional athletes and to learn my job. That was not easy all the time that was uh, sometimes it was it was tough to especially doing my job live because I had to conduct interviews in English I had to translate my English was okay but I, I for sure I, I made mistakes <laughs> and good for me the, the guys were not able to understand what I was saying in French but I probably made some mistakes but that was part of the learning process and uh, after that the team became much more popular, much more successful on the field. And I would say from 2000, when Anthony Calvillo became the number one quarterback, until 2010, when I left for a few years, when I left the beat, I would say these 10 years were the, the most fantastic of my, of my career because uh, it was such uh, an excitement to watch the Alouettes to win. They were winning on a regular basis, you know, Remember, guys, when they, they they clinched first place with five games remaining in the in the regular season, and then they were playing in front of what fifty five thousand fans at the Olympic Stadium, mm-hmm. the Eastern Finals, going to going to the Grey Cups, and so I, I was so lucky to 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 be a sports reporter and to be able to follow these guys. So most of the guys were just tremendous, great great guys, great athletes, class act. So I feel very lucky about that. You brought up a, actually a couple of questions which I, I don't think we've ever asked before. Um, first, my first question is: Was your first assignment going to cover the the Alouettes uh, logo uh, unveil over at Moe's near the Bell Center? Did you do that at that time, or did you start after that? Uh, 
Well, I, I, I started my career in 1994. Oh, when okay. I finished my CJEP, oh. I went to TQS, and I was there for one year and a half. I did cover hockey. Uh, also, if you remember, the Montreal Roadrunners, mm-hmm. the roller hockey team. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, some of the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League games and stuff like that. Okay. So, I did work a little bit on the... Habs beat. I remember that I was at the forum in 1995 when uh, Patrick Roy played his final game mm-hmm. and he, he, he was behind the bench with Mario Tremblay and Ronald Curry. So I was there for TQS. I still got my, my credential from that night. Wow. I, I keep it as a, as a memorabilia. Uh, and like I said, I, I really started to cover football and the Alouettes in 1996. This is at this, at this moment that I started to learn my job and to learn the game also. Right. I was not fully aware of all the rules and all the guys and I had not a I don't I didn't have a lot of, of history about the game because when the Alouettes left that was in nineteen eighty seven and I was twelve, thirteen at the time and I don't even remember attending one game in the eighties with the Concorde or the Alouettes. So I was a big Expos fan, a big Montreal Canadiens fan. I went also to the Manic games mm. at the Olympic Stadium and the Montreal Forum, but I was not into uh, football, not at all. Not okay, at all. okay. Um, one question, the question I want, I'll, and then I'll let Cliff chime in here. Um, you talked about when it comes to speaking with a player in English, and you're and you're doing the you know yeah. the RDS broadcast, and then you're having to translate it. Mm-hmm. So if fans are, 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 I'm sure fans are wondering. How hard actually is that, David? Because you know they need to remember you're like, you're <laughs> like being a translator on the spot. Mm-hmm. So how do absolutely you, how do you wh- well what what do you do? They say something and then you give a a shortened version of it, or do you try to translate it as best as possible into the for the French audience? Yeah, I try my best, but you're absolutely right. When you conduct interviews, live interviews, most of the time it happens at halftime when the guy was on the field mm-hmm. maybe 30 seconds before. So he's still, you know, excited or he's, still, he's mad about a, a, a negative play or something like that. Or you conduct interviews after the games when the guys are, you know, ecstatic, they are happy or they are on the verge to cry because right. they lost a crucial game. So it's, it's very tough to be honest. Uh, I, I, I have a lot of respect for guys doing that, uh, you know, going from French to English and then coming back to French. Uh, yeah, I was trying to understand the key words of each sentence of each answer. What was tough for me was to, to understand the accent from a guy coming from Tennessee. Or oh yeah. Florida or Georgia, you know, their their accents are are very tough. So that was a, that was a, a challenge for me. But when I said that I made mistakes, yes, but I don't think that I misinterpreted their their comments. Right. I don't think that I ever said something that was totally wrong. But you know, guys, the vocabulary is not uh, as easy for a, a French-speaking guy mm-hmm. trying to speak in English. You know, if you want to say something, but it's not the accurate word. So, but uh, you're totally right. Oh, I was happy. I was also lucky to uh, to be around a team winning most of the time. So that made my job easier. But. I do remember in 2008 when the Alouettes played the Grey Cup game at the Olympic Stadium against Calgary, and they lost the game. Yeah. And you remember that the stadium was full with Alouettes fans, and a lot of people expected the Alouettes to win. And I remember I went into the dressing room, and one of the first that I interviewed was Anthony Calvi, who was saying in his locker. And uh, if you remember, it will be had won in 2002, but they lost in 03, 05, 06, and now 08. So what do you ask to one of the best quarterbacks ever after such a tough loss in front of their home fans, except how does it feel? Uh, Mm -hmm. You must be very disappointed because now it, it makes four losses in a row at the Grey Cup. Uh, are you disappointed that you, do you feel that you let down your teams stuff like that? But 
when the, when the interview is over and you go back home and you think about the questions, sometimes you feel stupid. Sometimes you would like to be able to erase all these questions and to do it one more time, just to, because you don't want to, you don't want to um, show disrespect to the athletes. I'm sure Anthony and all the guys after the 08 game, they, they did want, they did want to win the game in Montreal. They did, they didn't lose on purpose. So, but sometimes, you know, when you're live and you ask questions and you try to do your best and sometimes stupid questions happen and, 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 but you know, like I said, it's live television and, uh, hopefully they, they understood that I was trying to do my best. Yeah. And, uh, but I think that, uh, my batting average is pretty good with these guys. I don't <laughs> think that I've had tough, tough problems or tough relationships with uh, most of these guys. Yeah. And I can tell you, by the way, David, even, even us in English, we, we too have problems understanding the guys who live from the deep South too. So don't worry about it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 feel, I feel relieved now. <laughs> Cliff? And don't worry about asking stupid questions. We, I think we, Tim and I, we, we sort of back, go back and forth on ourselves. Like, should we have asked that? <laughs> Did we ask the right questions too? And you know, yeah. in the same way, we don't want to say the wrong things either. So it, it's always a, it, it's never easy. That's, that's, that's for sure. As oh, far no. as speaking with players and that, it's oh, no. never an easy thing to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, I want to talk to you about uh, when you became the broadcaster for the Alouettes. Um, you were paired up with, uh, and you still are paired up with uh, Pierre Vercheval. Uh, how has yep. he been as far as trying to get you educated into football? Do you, think, do you feel he's get, given you a big hand as far as trying to get you up to speed with the game of football itself? Uh, when I started, I did work for many years uh, only as a sideline reporter. I started uh, with Pierre Durivage, was our play-by-play guy. Uh, and Pierre Vercheval became our caller man in 2002 after the horrible 2001 season with Rod Rust. And uh, so I was on the sidelines with Denis Casava doing the play-by-play things, and I became the play-by-play guy in 2014. So I would say that between 96 and 2014, I've been able to learn the game, to learn about the rules and to, to watch tapes. You know, I remember coming back home after games and trying to watch it on my VHS machine. You know, I did record the, the game and I wanted to, 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 to watch the games again and to understand what was going on. So this is how I learned a lot about, about the game by watching it on TV. And, uh, and in French, there's not a lot of, of books related to the game, to the rules. So I, I really did learn it by myself. Of course, I asked questions, but uh, I know I would say that most of the time I, I did my homework alone and I, I did learn it by watching, I don't know how many games. So that's, that's how I, I learned my, my job. But becoming a play-by-play was not an easy job also because you don't learn it at school. You don't learn to become a play-by-play guy. You, I did learn it. I remember we, we did some university football games on RDS. So I went to Concordia and I went to McGill and to Laval. And so this is how I started as a play-by-play. But I, I learned it live on TV, on RDS, not a small TV network somewhere near Quebec City. or No, I was on the big network and doing my job and making mistakes and trying to improve myself. And uh, when I, I became the play-by-play guy in 2014, I, I always had a tremendous respect for Denis Casada. I think Denis is one of the top play-by-play hosts in French and even in English. He did work on the English radio many years ago, and I, I believe that Denis is one of the top, and he, he always has been a great role model to me. So when I, I succeeded to him and I became the play-by-play, I did maybe put too much pressure on my shoulders. May, I would say that for one, two, three years, I didn't feel comfortable enough to do my job. I did it. Maybe people at home never noticed that I was not confident or I was not good enough, but I, I did put so much pressure on my shoulders because I felt that people would 
compare myself and Denis, and they would make they would say, "Ah, Denis was so good with Pierre Vacheval. They are such a, a great duo. They, they 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 are wonderful." And I didn't want to be compared with him, so I did put a lot of pressure on myself. But maybe after three years, I I said to myself, "Be yourself. Don't try to be like Denis. You're not Denis. Nobody will be like Denis." He's the top, and I'll try to do my best and be yourself uh, according to my my behavior, my feelings, my sense of humor. I I, I like to laugh. I'm uh, I'm very good for that, and and Pierre knows that now because he makes a lot of jokes on air, and he knows that he's gonna make me laugh. And uh, also, when the guys are are making big plays, I remember that during my first three years. I stopped myself by screaming or by expressing myself with a lot of energy because Denis is such a, I wouldn't say a straight guy, but you know, he's a classic play by play guy. Mm -hmm. And I said, I gotta be as him. I gotta be like him. And after that, I said, no, no, no. If a guy makes a great catch, I'm gonna scream. First down, not, not obviously not in English, but <laughs> premier essay, quel touché, fantastic, oh, quel attrapé. And, and I really felt comfortable, like I said, maybe starting in 2017, 2018. And now, uh, this is my eighth year now as a play-by-play -play guy doing NFL and CFL. And I feel really happy, really comfortable. Uh, hopefully, I'm going to do this job for the rest of my career. I would love to work many more years with Pierre. Pierre is older than me, so he might retire one day while I'm not finished with that. But uh, hopefully I'm going to work with him for a long time because he's the perfect fit for me. He's the perfect partner. I trust him. He trusts me. Uh, we both like to laugh. We both like our job, our energy. And uh, I feel very fortunate to be able to work with Pierre. And also all the guys on the panel, Mathieu Prou, I did cover him uh, throughout his career in the CFL. I do remember him playing at Laval University because I was doing some play-by-play -play for uh, Laval games at the time. Bruno Epel, I do remember his first year in Montreal in 1997 when he scored a touchdown against the Argos at the Olympic Stadium. Somebody blocked a punch from Mike Vanderjack and, and Bruno scooped the ball and he scored a touchdown. I do remember vividly this, uh, this, this moment and, uh, Gigi also, and Danny Derivo, they are such great guys and, and we are such a great team that hopefully we'll be able to work together for a long period of time. Do you, excellent. Do you have a, a broadcaster that you look up to specifically? Cause obviously you, as you said, you're trying to make your play by play your own, you know, when you yeah. think, when I hear yeah. of, you know, being exuberant and excited when they score a touchdown, it reminds me of Jacques Dussault, how he used to you know, do the play-by-play -play yeah. for the for the Expos and how he used to really get excited. Is there one, whether it be an English or a French broadcaster that you have looked, that you look up to besides the ones you've mentioned already? Yeah, and, uh, besides Denis Casava, I, I do remember that while I was young, I really liked Ron McLean as a host on Hockey Night in Canada. He's not a play-by-play -play guy, but he's, he's a guy that I really appreciated. Bob Cole was also a great play-by-play -play guy. Uh, I'm too young to remember Danny Gallivan or even René Le Cavalier. Of course, I know how they, they sound because I've seen so many B-roll and archives from their, their tremendous years, so I, I do remember them, but I, I, I don't remember being a kid watching them on Hockey Night in Canada or La Soirée du Hockey. In the United States, uh, I know that Al Michaels is good. Uh, Joe Buck, Mike Tirico. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are the guys, but I, like, like I said, I don't try to, I don't try to be like themselves. Obviously, I, I listen to them because sometimes I do record games in English and I watch them just to see or to listen how did they call this particular play mm -hmm. did they miss it because just an example i missed it i didn't see the ball 
uh, caught by the guy. I thought the ball had, had touched the ground. So I watched it in English just to did he make a, mus- a mistake also in English, you know, mm-hmm. he, or, or he saw the, the, the play perfectly. So uh, this is what I do, but I don't try to to be as as them. I, obviously, I, I do have a lot of respect for these guys. I think they're 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 the best of the business. But uh, I try to be to be myself. So uh, just to to answer your question, yes, Denis was a role model. Uh, Bob Cole as a play by play. In French, we had in. In hockey, we had Richard Garneau, who did uh, La Soirée du Hockey play-by-play for many years. We also had Claude Kenville. So uh, these guys were pretty good in in hockey. But in football, the only models, the only French models that I've had were Pierre Durivage and Denis Casava. And I'm the third play-by-play in the third major or main play-by-play guy for RDS in the last... Uh, 32, 33 years. So uh, we haven't had a lot of play-by-play guys. That's amazing. That that's really amazing. That to be your num- being number, you know, it's it's kind of like I, gu- I guess a good analogy would be the Pittsburgh Steelers. They've had like what four head coaches in the last sixty years. You're yeah. You're, you're only the third play-by-play guy for the Chuck, Alouettes. Chuck Knoll, yeah. Chuck Knoll, Mike Tomlin, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, Bill Cowher yep. before. Yep. yep, exactly. So it's yep. yeah. Um, yep. What. Uh, uh, you and I go back and forth quite a bit on social media when it comes to 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 stats and stuff like that. I'll shoot you stuff. I'll retweet some of the stuff, and we'll correct each other. You corrected mm-hmm. me last week, actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, what about the o- the OT game? Exactly, exactly. What what got you into? And besides, obviously, I'm I'm guessing because of of broadcasting. But did were you? Did you like looking into different stats and like that before you got into broadcasting, oh, yeah. or has broadcasting made you love statistics? I would say both. Yeah. When I was a kid, I always looked at the statistics. Uh, I, I do remember that I was reading the newspapers and trying to figure out who had the best night, the best game, who had more, the most points and stuff like that. And um, when I became a sportscaster and especially a play-by-play guy, uh, obviously you got to find something interesting for your viewers. Uh, yes, you can say uh, premier essay de la ligne de trois verges or first down uh, after a 17-yard gain, mm-hmm. but you got to find something different, you know. So I really like when I'm able to um, to find something, you know, that little that little thing that makes the stats, you know, more special than the ones that all the people see, you know, coming from the game notes. And right. so I, I do my, my, my homeworks. I would say that I put probably two hours for each game. So I, I go through the stats and I try to see if there's something that comes up, uh, one player or one team, especially, I, I always try to find something and that's my little secret, but I'm going to share it with you. Uh, usually I do, um, book, I do pre-schedule all my tweets. So I know that uh, 30 minutes before game time, I'm going to send through email, or not email, but Twitter, I'm going to send this tweet in particular right. about William Stenback, you know, get, having a four-game, 100 rushing yard streak or stuff like that. So most of the time, this is what I do. I, I schedule these uh, these tweets. And also, I have probably... 200 tweets ready in my computer. So if something happens during the game, during the first com- commercial break, I am able to send something on Twitter because I'm, I'm ready for that. So I probably have 200 tweets ready. That's cool. No matter what. That's Let's neat. say uh, BJ Cunningham. BJ Cunningham has uh, 100 receiving yards. I got something ready for him. That's if nice. Vernon Adams throws for 400 passing yards, you will see it uh, almost automatically that uh, that's his fourth career 400 passing yard games, and he ties a team record for blah blah blah. So that's yeah. just an example, but uh, yeah, I really enjoy it. This is this is what I one of the parts that I like the most about my job to go through the stats and to try to find something that will create an interest among our viewers or my followers on Twitter. 
I have a suggestion for you, David, is that yep. I know, uh, I'm sure you use the pregame notes that the Alouettes use and that the CFL sends out. Um, I know CFL stats guru Steve Daniel quite well, and I have, yeah. I've sometime, I, I actually just emailed him last night with something, I, and I may not use it because I may pass it along to you or to somebody else. And if you ever have yeah. an idea of a very unique stat that you want to possibly, if it can be looked uh, looked up, reach out to Steve, mm -hmm. and he'll 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 do his okay. best to try to get you that stat because I I can imagine with him and all the years of his experience, the book he has a wide open book and he has he has a, he has a oh, wealth yeah. a oh, wealth yeah. of knowledge a wealth of knowledge. So oh yeah 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 I know him and our stat and our stat guy from RDS also. Uh, reaches him a lot of times when he wants to know something specifically about a player mm -hmm. or a milestone or something like that. Yo, I know Steve is such a great guy. He's, uh, you're right to say that he's a stats guru for yeah. sure. Yeah, um, and it's like because because one came across my mind, and I wonder if it did with you too. And then I'll let I'll let Cliff continue here. Is that um, you know the Alouettes this past week had the first two plays were sacks, okay, and then yeah. the first three passing plays were also sacks. So I, I emailed Steve. Wow. I emailed Steve and I said, hey, what about this? And he goes, you know what? I thought about the exact same thing when it occurred. So no. he's not oh, got, really? yeah, he's not gotten back to me yet. He thinks it in the 14 years that he's been keeping track, it's never happened. But if I do happen to get the stat before game time on Saturday, I'll make sure I send yeah. it over to you. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. But you know what? Uh, Pierre and I were amazed by this start. I mean, I don't recall in the past 25 years such a great start by the Alouettes. Mm -hmm. To get two sacks on the first two plays and then being able to score a touchdown after, what, three plays only, one pass, one run, and one other pass to Jake Winicky, mm -hmm. that was very, very unusual. And I personally, I don't recall that type of, of start by the other way. Yes. I might be wrong, but I I don't recall that. No, I agree. No. Cliff. All right. Uh David, when it comes to your career as a as a broadcaster, in your opinion, can you tell us what you think are the most memorable and most unmemorable moments as being a broadcaster for the Alouettes? Yeah. Uh most memorable moment like on a personal basis, uh, was the 2009 Grey Cup in Calgary when the 13 men. Uh, that was a classic. I remember I was standing on the sidelines. I was not a play-by-play, -play, but just a reporter at the time. I was on the sidelines. I do remember all the Alouettes players standing on the line, and, you know, they, they're waiting to see what's going to happen. I remember that Damon Juval missed his first try at the end of the game to, to, to clinch the Grey Cup. And then we all realized that there was a penalty and they had a second chance. And after that, Duval made the kick. The Alouettes won. Um, Mathieu Pou was on the sidelines. And Mathieu, because he's, he's a francophone, I've had the occasion to interview him many times. So we were not friends, but we had a very good relationship. And when Juval made the kick to win the Grey Cup, I screamed at Mathieu and I said, Mathieu! And he, he turned and he looked at me and he jumped in my arms. <laughs> and he jumped so high that I had my face on his stomach. You know, he was almost <laughs> on my shoulders because he had such energy and such long legs. And so I, I, I grabbed him and then he went on the field to celebrate, and I conducted interviews. I think my first interview was with rookie long snapper Martin Bedard, who made the snap, the, 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 the snap to uh, Ben Cahoon, mm -hmm. and Damon Duval was the kicker. So, and, and Martin is a very likable guy. He's, he, he's a very gentleman, you know, he's a very good guy. He was, he's always respectful, and he's not speaking too loud, you know, and and I said, Martin, you just won the Grey Cup. Uh, tell me, how does it feel? You made the snap. And the, the poor guy was unable to talk. You know, he was like, oh, 
Oh, well, oh, that's, that's, oh, it's amazing. You know, I, oh, I'm so happy. So I remember this interview. I remember Damon. And then we went into the dressing room and I conducted live interviews from the dressing room. And the guys were so happy because remember, some of them had lost at the Grey Cup in 03, 05, 06, 08. Mm -hmm. Paul Lambert was one of them. Paul Lambert joined the Alouettes in 2003. So he was still with the Ticats in 02 when the Alouettes won the Grey Cup. So he wasn't on the team. And he probably joined the Alouettes not only to play for his hometown team, but also to be able to win the Grey Cup because the Alouettes had always good chances each season to win the Grey Cup. But the poor guy lost four cups in a row. So can you imagine how relieved and happy he was in the dressing room when I talked to him and he was finally able to celebrate and to share his, his feelings about winning the Grey Cup? And he said he had two beers in his hands and he said and he, he had goggles, you know, ski goggles, the, yeah. the big glasses, yeah. you know? And he said, put, put your goggles on. And he poured beer on my head. <laughs> and I do have in my office at home, I don't have many pictures in my, in my office at home, but I have three pictures. And I'm looking at these pictures as I'm talking to you right now. I have one picture from 2009 when Paul Lambert put beer on my head and I'm laughing. I have one picture... I think that's from, yeah, that's from the 09 Grey Cup Parade in Montreal, the big one with a lot of people on St. Catherine Street. And don't ask me why, but I was able to be on one of the big trucks with Ben Cahoon. There's Ben Cahoon, Brian Chu, and Ben is holding the Grey Cup to the fans, and I'm on the truck. And I, I think I was doing live reports for RDS. And somebody took a picture of that from the street, and he did send it to me. And Ben signed the picture for me. So it says Ben Kahu, number 86, Grey Cup, 09. And you see myself perfectly right beside Brian Chu and Ben Cahoon. This is one of my best moments. And the other one I, I see now is a picture in 2000, uh, 2002 at the Olympic Stadium in the dressing room when the Alouettes uh, won the Eastern Final. And they're all going crazy because they're 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 going to the Grey Cup. So I see Mark Megna, Matt Petz, and Adriano Belli, and they're all having fun, and they're trying to put water into my jacket and to uh, well, that, that's they're they're just crazy, you know. And I'm trying to escape them, but I'm unable. So, like I said, I have three pictures in my office at home. And these are the pictures from the Alouette. So uh, I would say uh, 2009 Grey Cup was the, the best moment. And for the worst moment, uh, probably, probably, well, there are a few. 2001 was a tough season because they, they had such a great first half. And then they lost, I don't know how many games in a row, probably eight games in a row in the second half. And mm -hmm. they finished third in the Eastern Division, and they lost uh, in Hamilton. So that was a very disappointing season. Um, the years with Don Matthews were not very funny. Yes, the team was winning. The guys were great. The players were great. But Don was such a, <clears throat> I cannot say the word, <laughs> but uh, he was not very good to us. As a media, that was a really tough to cover the team on a daily basis because he, he, he didn't like us, or maybe he liked us, but he wanted to play with us, and he was such a... He was disrespectful. This is, I, uh, this is what I would say about him. And uh, so that was not easy to cover the team, but good for us. The team was good enough on the field, so that was... It made our job a little bit easier, but uh, Don was probably the, the, the worst head coach that I've covered uh, throughout my career in Montreal. Uh, and beside that, no, the, maybe the last seasons in 2017 when the team was really bad, when Cavis was the, the general manager and we had so many head coaches after uh, Mark Tressman left Montreal, Dan Hawkins, and 
Tommy Higgins, who was a very good guy. Tommy Higgins, I have nothing to say against uh, against him. He's he's a, he's a gentleman, but that was that was tough. And then Jacques Chapdelaine and Jim Pop came back, and so these years were not funny. But uh, I would say that uh, in 25 years covering the team, I have 90 percent great memories about that, and maybe 10 percent, but. Uh, no, I, I like I said at the start of our conversation. I'm I feel fortunate. I feel uh, lucky, really lucky to be to be on this on this beat to be able to cover this team. I have a lot of respect for the guys, for the management, um, and hopefully I'll be able to uh, to be on the beat as a play-by-play guy for many years to come. That's cool, and obviously, um, you know we we really appreciate your time, David, because it's. Obviously, you're a busy schedule. I know you have a family to deal with and stuff like that. But obviously, we, we, we hope to have you back on, on the show in the near future because it's it's great to get this type of perspective from, you know, not necessarily just the players, but also from the broadcasters who watch this team uh, almost every week. Mm-hmm. So uh, we, we really appreciate your time. Um, Before we let you go, uh, if they want to... Uh, follow you on social media besides watching you each week on on multiple ways you know not just the Alouettes broadcast but many other ways on RDS but how would how do they follow yep. you on social media well I'm on Twitter so my uh, name is at Arsenal A-R-S-E-N-A-U-L-T RDS so this is my name on Twitter also I have a uh, Facebook account so if you want to send me a friend re- request uh, most of the time I I do accept it. So <laughs> this is how I, I exchange with people on, on Facebook. I do have an Instagram account, but I don't remember what's my, <laughs> what's my name on that. But, uh, no, it's very easy to, uh, to, uh, to reach me. So, and most of the time I, I try to respond to people because I think that it's, uh, it's, uh, a sign of respect when people ask you questions, when they, they send you good comments or even, bad comments about our job. I think that it's part of the business to, uh, to, uh, to be accessible and to respond to the, the viewers and the fans. And so I always try to do my best, uh, unless you're very disrespectful with me, which, which doesn't happen a lot of time. I would say that it happened maybe once or twice in my career. Most of the time I, I try to answer to, uh, to each request, each comment because, uh, that's part of my job, and I totally accept it and understand it. Great to have David on, and uh, we have to have him, have him back on because, uh, hey. Yeah, we, we got a lot out of him, but I feel like it, we've only just scratched the oh, surface. I agree with you. I agree with you. I was looking at the time. I was like, oh, man, do I? It's like, ah, oh, well, nothing I can yeah. do about it. But, but yeah, please. I mean, always, it's always leave him wanting more. That's what, it, that's what it comes down to. So, I mean, listen, we, we definitely appreciate uh, David spending some time with us to yeah. talk football and. As he said, anytime he wants to come back on to have a chat with us, he's definitely more than welcome here on the flight deck. Yeah. So, uh, also before we continue, reminder we are on social media, multiple places, obviously, that you can find us. Again, our Twitter account is at Alouettes FL Deck. You can find us on Instagram. You can find us on, uh, you can find us on Facebook. You can find Cliff and myself on the, on the future of social media for sports over in iLily. That's through our Twitter accounts. That's, that's Cliff at, at Cliff E D and then me at Repact R E P P A C T. Also, if you want to catch up on any of the episodes you may have missed, you can hit our archive over at alouettesflightdeck.ca. And obviously, Cliff, there are more other places where they can catch up on the podcast, right? Absolutely. First and foremost, you can always find the podcast at alouettesflightdeck.ca. As we mentioned, not just the archives, but new episodes you can always find there. You can find the Alouette's Flight Deck on YouTube. Just search Alouette's Flight Deck. Uh, make sure you like, subscribe, and uh, don't forget, folks, we do have our contest. Like Once we hit 100 YouTube subscribers, we're going to be giving away a pretty sweet prize. So make sure you like, subscribe, leave a comment, good or bad, but uh, let us know that you're paying attention to the Flight Deck on YouTube. And if you'd rather just listen to the podcast, you can do so at pretty much anywhere you can find uh, you know, anywhere you listen to podcasts, you can find the Alouette's Flight Deck, whether it's uh, global, uh, Google Podcasts, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, you name it. Pretty much anywhere where there's a podcast, you'll be able to find us. 
So make sure you check us out. Uh, by all means, give us likes, subscribe there as well. Make sure that you're ready to go for when the next episode drops. Uh, you know, we definitely appreciate each and everyone's support. And also, too, want, can't forget, we are a proud member of the Canadian Football Podcast Network. So many great shows out there. Make sure you check them out at CF Pod Network. Check, you know, whatever team you want to listen to, by all means, there's a podcast for it. So check it out. Proud to be a member of this great association and looking forward to so many more. Yeah. Um, the the injury report came out today, and obviously, and everybody remembers it, it's it's a five day gap in between the games, but the Alouettes only pra- started practicing today, you know, which is Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Um, did any names stand out to you, whether it be good or bad? I mean, for me, it was good to see that William Stanbeck was in full participation. Because it makes me even, pot, you know, I could be become even giddier. Is that a word? That, but it's possibility that both Stanbeck and Artist Payne could be in the same backfield together. Oh, oh, that's, that's frightening. Oh, that would be nice. I mean, if, if I'm if I'm Ottawa, I am pooping myself just a little bit at the thought of both Stanbeck and Artist Payne back there to give Schultz a hand. Yes. Please, please, football gods. This, this is the case. This please, is the case of, if the, yeah. <laughs> please, Coach Kahari. <laughs> this is definitely a case of if the left one don't get you, or the right one will, because that 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 would be quite the one-two punch in the backfield for yeah. the Alouettes. Yeah. Anything else stand out for you? I mean, it was good to see Tony Washington. He was full participation because I know there was somewhat of an issue. Um, but there are still some names on there that, you know, that were playing last week that are not playing this week. And that's why we've had some, some, some new signings by the Alouettes done today. Well, I mean, the most obvious name on the, <laughs> on the, on the list, Vernon Adams Jr. Yeah. I mean, he's now on the six game list and it's, do you see him pulling tough. off a of Bo Levi? I hope not. And it, again, yes, we want Vernon back, but we do not want him coming back as anything less than himself. We want him at 100%. Yeah. And if that takes all six games, so be it. Like I said, I've got complete faith that Matthew Schiltz can can drive this car with no, with no hesitation. Yeah. Uh, like I said, it, it's, it's tough to think about, you know, VA getting hurt the way he did and being six-gamed. And I don't know if that's going to be his season right there. I mean, it's tough, but, you know, like it's it's football, man. Like, what, what else can you do about it? No, I know. Uh, as, as far as other names that uh, are concerned, uh, Antonio Simmons uh, still not uh, still not participating in, in in practice. I mean, I mean that's the kind of guy that you want to have out there on the field. I mean, let's not forget this defensive line for the Alouettes has proven itself time and time again to be a force. When it, all cylinders are clicking, this is a very dangerous unit, and he's a big part of that. And to not see him out there is is tough. But I mean. Like, the other guys are just stepping up. Guys like Armando Sewell, Nick Usher, uh, Michael Wakefield. I mean, these guys too have been—they've been outstanding. David Menard, when he's gotten into the lineup, he—he he can put—he—he he can put a hurt on a lot of people. And I—I just—I would love to see Simmons back out there, but hopefully he'll, he can heal up and whatever whatever nagging issues he's got, hopefully they can get taken care of in short order so that he's back. Especially too for what's going to end up becoming, no doubt, a playoff push. Yeah. So I mean, like a lot of these guys, like it's it's tough to see their names on the list. But if the Alouettes can just get through the next couple of games, get these guys healthy, get them back in the lineup just in time for that playoff push, that's going to be a good thing. That's going to be uh, that should really put a lot of people's minds at ease, especially with just how Montreal has been stepping up and making things happen. Even in losses, they find ways to at least step up and make people take notice. It's just now a matter of stop trying to beat yourself. And I think we saw a little bit of that in, even in this game on Monday is lax. There's a lot of lax in days club plays. There's a lot of th- things just weren't working for a certain for for a time. And it, even though I'm 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 not a fan of this whole cardiac kids thing in the sense that why not do this all the time? Yeah. Why wait until the last three minutes of the game before you decide? Oh crap, we got to win this thing. Let's go! Like it's it makes for exciting football. I'm not going to lie, but at the same time, there's a part of me is like. How about you just do this the whole game? How about you just run a table on these guys? Like I, 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 I just don't understand why you need to wait till like the last three minutes of the game to realize, oh, this is winnable. 
let's go out and win this game. Like, it's, yeah, exactly. I, I, I don't get it. I just don't get it. But I suppose as long as you get the result, like, as long as you win, winning fixes everything, right? So mm-hmm. I mean, if 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 that's how you got to do it, that's how you got to do it. But it's it's not good for our hearts, man. We're we're you know, we're getting too old it's- for this. Sh- man <laughs> well it's 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 kind of good that i mean if we think about it you know with toronto having a bye week this week if Al- the owls do go into uh to ottawa this this weekend and win they'll they'll be two points out a first with toronto coming to montreal the next week mm-hmm. but again and- again we still got to play ottawa that's the thing we still have to play and beat ottawa for that scenario to occur right and trust me like even though Ottawa's this will be their third game in 10 days and no doubt they've got to be hurting but at the same time they've also too they've got that sense of urgency as well because they're not mathematically eliminated from playoff contention no but they got to win and it's got to start now like you're, you're you're really coming into crunch time as far as the season goes exactly so I mean there's there, like it, if you're a CFL team and you're not starting to feel that you know that 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 pressure to go out there and win every single game as far as I'm concerned, there's really no more gimmies anymore. Like, I think we're pretty much well into it enough that you know if you're going to be making the playoffs or not. Like, you, you've you mm-hmm. got to be feeling it right now. So yeah. I know everybody's worried with, with VA being out of the lineup. Like, a lot of people are automatically thinking, oh, it's over for the Alouettes. So like, it's not over for the Alouettes. Right. I, I, I can tell you that right now. Like, this team will – if they go down, they're going to go down swinging. But, again, I still have more than enough faith in the system that's in place, the players that are in place that – They'll still win matches. They'll still go out there and they'll give their all. And so much can happen in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, that's, that's the one thing you got to look at is every game is winnable and also every game is losable too. But I, I think with with what this team has in its lineup right now, I think I still I still very much believe in this football team. I still think that they have the pieces in place. I think they just got to stop beating themselves they got to knock it off with some of the selfish penalties that they take oh geez don't remind me about that this week i mean another 10 for over 100, 100 over 120 yards or whatever it was it, it, it still has to stop yeah it, it's ridiculous no i mean and you can't just go and thinking okay well it's the red blacks they suck you know you can't you can't go in with that mindset and i, I want to believe that they're not going to i think they they were given a good lesson that hey you know what these guys nearly beat you mm-hmm. with field goals my no less yeah. so i i, I think you know, even though it's a quick turnaround uh, game wise, I, I, th- I think Montreal realizes what they have to do. And I think they're going to get the job done on yeah, Saturday. Stop the penalties. Nine, nine of them for a 138. Stop them. Please, 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 please. Um, interesting situation that I know you wanted to explain when it came to our long snapper. Because, you know, similar to the William Stambick thing where we had no clue that he had, dam- he had hurt his ribs. You know, we'd only seen that that artist Payne came in. Yeah, in relief in the in overtime or in Hamilton, uh, there's something very unique with the with our long snapper, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, somehow Pierre Le Caron managed to hurt his chest, and he's wasn't at practice today. He didn't participate. Very interesting though, because throughout the game, like we like where our seats are located at the stadium, like we're pretty much behind the Alouettes bench, so we see everything that's going on. Like, and I saw Pierre Le snapping the ball fairly consistently like constantly practicing with uh joseph zima and uh and uh was uh, david cote mm-hmm. you know just part of their job as special teamers just staying ready so i'm not sure exactly where uh pierre de Caron got hurt to the point where he wouldn't be able to participate in in practice i'm hoping it's just a a minor thing but but i, I, but I definitely the, did see yeah but I say, with, with who the owls signed today kind of Kind of makes us wonder if it's a lot more serious this week. Potentially, or is it an insurance policy? Either way, yeah, the Alouettes do have another long snapper now in their their midst in Zach Greenberg. Uh, it's think- a national national player, too. So, I mean, that's – which is good because Pierre Caron is clearly a national player. So, obviously, you, you don't have to worry about uh, futzing with the ratio or anything like that. So, that's – that's definitely a positive. Yeah, and I think he was in camp before, if I'm not mistaken. I have to go back and check. But these these are names that the Alves have, have had in camp prior. You know, uh, we'll talk about the other two in a minute. But what is very interesting is because of the long snapper, that whole situation with, with Edmonton is very possible that we could have had our old long snapper back, potentially. In theory, we could have. Uh, Martin Bedard, who played so many years here in Montreal, won great cups with the Alouettes. Uh, he was not signed again to the uh, to the team uh, 
as they would decide to go with uh, a younger option in Pierre-Luc Caron. And again, if it works, it's fine. But it, it's just funny because uh, Martin Bedard did end up actually signing with the Edmonton Elks last week. Yeah, I thought Bedard uh, had said he was going to retire. Was that, or was it the case where they didn't sign him? It was the case they didn't sign him, and I guess he was starting to prepare for his career after football. He had said, "Like I'm, all, I'm ready to go if need be." But yeah, yeah. then I guess Edmonton came calling. And it's kind of funny because he's actually going to be reunited with an old buddy of his in Sean White, former Alouettes oh, kicker. God, that's right. <laughs> I mean these these guys were roommates uh, when uh, both played in Montreal. They both, uh, you know, became really good friends over the years. Uh, you know, working and playing together. Uh, so I, I imagine Whitey is very excited to have uh, Marty come and join him out in Edmonton. Yeah. Even though things aren't great with the Elks right now, but, uh, you know, they, they too, uh, they're, uh, his Chad Rempel is their, uh, their longtime long snapper, and he got a serious injury, hence why Marty is heading out west. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's great for him. You know, I'm really happy to see him back in the league and back playing. Just would have been nice if it was for Montreal, especially now that Montreal needs a long snapper, apparently. Oh, wait a minute. I just thought about something, too. What's that? It would have to be Caron this week because Greenberg's in protocol in quarantine protocol. Right. It, I keep forgetting about that. I keep forgetting about that. Yikes. Okay. Well, I guess we'll see what happens. Well, that's it. I mean, that's why I figured it's more of an insurance policy than anything else. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's the, that's the thing with long snappers is you don't realize how important they are until you don't have one. Mm-hmm. Like they are very much the unsung heroes when it comes to football. Is the long snapping position because not everybody can do it. Or at least not do it very well. So if you got yourself a good long snapper, you treat him like gold. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, the ramifications of VA going on the sixth game. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, Schultz is going to be our starting quarterback. Mm-hmm. And the Alouettes activated Shea Patterson. Yep. To uh, off, the, off the practice roster, uh, quarterback out of Michigan. Yep. Who uh, also, has not uh, had a single snap in the CFL. Nor dressed, so this will be his first dressing opportunity. Yeah, he he spent uh, training camp with the BC Lions, uh, was on their practice roster for a good couple of months, but no, never never actually saw any action uh, with the Lions. Uh, was really released last month, and then the LOS picked him up a couple of weeks later. And good thing they did because at least, you know, like I said, as far as insurance policy goes, that's that's what he was. It's just a you know. An experienced hand that, uh, yeah, even though he's never played in the CFL, we, you know, he, he had himself a very solid career with the University of Michigan. Uh, played in the Spring League too. Yep, uh, played in the XFL. Yeah. So I mean, like, you know, he 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 knows how to throw a football, which is good. So I think I think he, he's going to get an education pretty much. Uh, I, I don't know how much action he'll actually get a chance to see is uh, with Matt Schiltz. Uh, you know, as a starter, I don't know if they're going to maybe incorporate Patterson in for some third down situations, uh, like uh, QB sneaks or anything like that. But uh, I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see what happens at TD plays. But uh, as it stands right now, uh, the Elvis did add another quarterback to the uh, mm. to the practice roster. Yep. Uh, Quentin Dormady, who played uh, for the University of Central Michigan, which is always a fun school to watch because uh, like it's a smaller school. But man, they, they, they got some exciting players there. And uh Actually, uh, you may remember a former Alouettes quarterback uh, for a little while came from the University of Central Michigan, one Dan Lefevre. Oh, yes, yes. So who just Alouettes, really just had a cup of coffee, less than a cup of coffee. <laughs> well, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, he uh, I mean, I don't want to say I remember like the he, game Two two quarterbacks yeah. go down. Yeesh. Yeah. I, it's so funny. I even remember, too, like the, that year, like that year in training camp, people were pro. You know, pimping this guy like the next Ricky Ray. I'm like, whoa, pump well, the brakes he, here. He had done well. He had done well when, you know. So. He did okay. Yeah, in Ham- he had done okay in, ha- in Hamilton. So Right. But, I mean, like, they, they were knowing this guy as the next one. And he comes in for a series and gets his shoulder planted into the ground by Ottawa. <laughs> yes. And uh, that, that was pretty much the end of Good his Good memory. I couldn't remember who it was against. Good memory. Yep. So, so I, I don't know if the – here's hoping anyways that uh, – Quentin uh, Dormady has a, a much better time in Montreal than what uh, Dan Lefevre did. <laughs> yes. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you, dude. I agree with you. Um, I don't think anything. Like I said we have to keep track of the of the um, injury report for the next two days and see what's what. Oh, really tomorrow, to mention, actually. Oh, really, just tomorrow. Yeah. On Thursday. Can't forget to mention too, also that uh, Jermaine Gabriel, a national player out of uh, Bishop's University, has also been added to the practice That's roster. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. 
more defensive help, always a good thing. And of course, national player can't be mad at that. So, uh, you know, listen, it, it, it's good to see that the Alouettes are, you know, they're not walking wounded necessarily, but I mean, they, they've definitely taken a few shots and you just never know what's going to happen. So it's always good to have reinforcements and true to their word. You, you see Danny Machocha is doing the work. He's, he, he's getting on the horn and, and making moves happen if he, as he has to. Yeah. Uh, I, I see a lot of people though, are again with the, the VA injury, a lot of people are like, are, is Montreal going to go after a quarterback? And as of right now, even Machocha is saying it's a long shot. And really, truly, who can we go after? Well, the stuff the, Justin, the stuff Justin Dump said today on the on the Three Down podcast was interesting to say the least. It was interesting, you know. Go after Arbuckle. I'm thinking, why? Why would we trade for Arbuckle? He's in the same. He even said it too. It's the same division. Why would we do? Why would they do that for a team that's currently two point, four points behind them, and and they have a game in hand? Well, and if Montreal, if Montreal was going to blow their brains out to get a quarterback. Believe it or not, the one I would like for them to go after yeah. would be Jake Meyer out in Calgary. M- Mr. 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 Currently on COVID protocol. That see, that's kind of the <laughs> that's kind of the tough part. Is oh yeah, tested positive for COVID. Yeah. So does that mean that our uh, that uh, I mean, that the uh, percentage for of, of players uh, vaccinated will go down to go down to eighty three percent? Uh, that's good. That's a good question. <laughs> Safe to say, though, his uh, trade value probably plummeted. <laughs> that, <laughs> you know what? That's that's now. that's fair. That's fair. No, I. Uh, and again, I'm seeing a lot of people saying, uh, you know, trade for Trevor Harris. I'm like, um, no. Edmonton doesn't even want him. They're going to cut him by the end of the season. Yeah, like, no. We're not going to blow our brains out to get a Trevor Harris. And quite frankly, and I don't know if it's just because things are the way they are in Edmonton right now. I just don't know if bringing in Trevor Harris would help the Alouettes necessarily. I think Matthew Schultz would have to absolutely stink out the joint first before they even consider possibly something along those lines. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And I don't, I just don't see that happening. I honestly think, again, I believe enough in Matthew Schultz that he will be more than capable of handling things and helping keep the Alouettes very competitive in this. Yep. Game, Ottawa, um, Saturday, 4 p.m., Game will be on TSN, obviously. And just as a quick note, as I mentioned a couple weeks back, um, this game, uh, local radio will not be local radio. It'll be local internet. Uh, The game on TSN 690 will be broadcast online only at tsn690.ca, at least as of we're taping this. Um, Nothing else changes, I don't think. Um, I think nothing else changed as far as when it comes to French. Yeah, French will still be on uh, 98.5 FM. Obviously, serious radio, but that will be the Ottawa broadcast, um, TSN RDS. But yeah, the, because of the home opener for the for the Habs, uh, the game is going to be bumped to online radio only. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and by all means, check it out because you know our guys, Sean Campbell and Marco Bruyette, yeah. are they're going to bring it no matter what. I still don't understand, dude. If they can put it on the CJD last week because there were audio issues, just which blows my mind in itself. By the way you know broadcasting the game online only and because of issues broadcasting it online they had to bump it to cjd just bump it to cjd it's a saturday at four exactly like i I don't know what scintillating programming they have on cjd at four o'clock in the afternoon because well i don't really listen to the radio anymore but uh, i i'm pretty sure whatever they were broadcasting could probably have waited uh until after the football game potentially potentially yeah so uh, again uh yeah, that, so if you're, if you're looking to listen to the game online for some reason, uh, that, sorry, on, on the radio, you can't. Uh, you have to listen to it currently online over, at, again, as I said, tsn690.ca. Uh-huh. Um, don't know what to expect. The, the early line, actually, it's funny, Cliff. The early line currently is five points in favor of the Alouettes. The last time I checked, mm-hmm. they, they're a five-point favorite. With an over-under, I think it was 48 points. Double 48 check. points, yeah. I'm double-checking that now. Is it still five points? Yeah, it's still five still, points. yeah. So, and again, not a surprise considering Montreal has won both games so far against the Red Blacks. Uh, I mean, this the second game was a little bit more of a, a, a you know tightly uh, you know a tightly contested contest, but uh, I mean, it's still this, this still is the Alouettes versus the Red Blacks. Mm-hmm. I mean, even though deep down we know that these teams are you know they can't afford to take each other lightly, especially Montreal cannot afford to take the Red Blacks lightly because especially now with VA out of the lineup, like that changes a lot of the dynamic. I don't think it changes necessarily the game plan, you know, too, too, too much, but 
it definitely does change a lot of the dynamic and it definitely changes a lot of the perception that people have of this Montreal team. And I think Ottawa, they're right now they're in a team of they're they're a team of transition right now. Like they've got to get themselves figured out. I mean, I don't know if they're necessarily looking to towards twenty twenty two just yet. Because, like I said, they're not mathematically eliminated from the playoffs, but I mean, you got to win now. Like literally now, you have to start winning football games if you're the Red Blacks. Yeah, I agree. And they may they may want to take advantage of the situation. They they're probably hoping that Schultz just you know maybe he was just lucky in that last series. You and I know that he it, it wasn't just luck. No, because he looked both. Because I think that would have been the case. He would have looked got like garbage in Hamilton too, and he didn't. Exactly. So, but now that. Like, again, they've got some film on the guy. So, I mean, obviously, Ottawa's going to be game planning to try and get to Schultz, try and get, you know, make him uncomfortable. To me, it, this is what it's going to come down to. It's going to be a game that's going to be won in the trenches. I, I definitely think, you know, we're not going to see another blowout like we saw at TD Place and Labor Day weekend. But uh, I still think this is going to be a fun game. And I, I still think Montreal, they know what they have to do. They, mm-hmm. they know what's at stake. They know what they've got. It's just a matter of going out and executing. So I'm I'm really curious to see if Shea Patterson gets any reps at all at quarterback, as far as even just in third down situations. But uh, yeah, and just to just, me, go ahead. Sorry. To me, to me, what I think is important with this game is Matthew Shields has to establish himself early and often. I think he's got to trust if he's got that one-two punch in the backfield with uh, Stanback and Cameron Artis Payne. Oh, I hope so. That's going to help. I think lighten his load quite a bit. I think it's going to take a lot of the pressure off of him to have to make those, you know, highlight real plays. Like I, I think if he goes in and just does what he was doing against Hamilton, like if he, if he has that sort of same mindset of just go in there and just do your thing. And you saw what he did. Like it was just a, a very small sample size versus Hamilton and versus Ottawa. But you, you see the potential that he has. Yeah. yeah. He, he's got it down. Like, I, I think he's got this playbook down. I think he can adapt very well to this offense. And I think Kahari's going to adapt and kind of showcase a little bit more of Schultz's strengths. I, I still see him more as a, a pocket passer as opposed to being that mobile quarterback. Like, I don't see him being like VA in that sense. And I don't think people expect him to be. I think just be yourself. Be who we expect you to be. And just go out and do your thing. Like, I, I think if Matthew Shields can do that, they're going to come out with this W. I, I feel very confident in that. Yeah. Yeah. As I said, I think, I think, I think continuing it on the course, as I said, it's, it's, uh, Al can't look ahead, look ahead. They've done that way too many times over the past couple of years when it comes to big games leading up to, leading up to games with teams that are ahead of them. They need, oh, to, man. They, they need to finish this one first before they look forward uh, next, you know, for our next home game versus Toronto. Well, and you take a look, the game, the, the game, even this year against Calgary and against Toronto, those were winnable games. The Yellowish mm-hmm. should have walked out of the, both stadiums with a win yeah, and really, truly beat themselves. Cause they, I really felt those games that both times they looked past their opponent mm-hmm. and they got burned for it. Yeah, I know. I, I want to hope that this time they've learned their lesson and they're not going to look past Ottawa, even regardless of the fact that you just beat them a couple days ago. I, I don't expect them to look past Ottawa. I think they're just going to go in, work their plan. And I, I think they're going to do what they need to do. Simple as that. And that's all you have to do. Yep. Here's hoping, dude. Here's hoping. That's as I said, we can. We uh, at the moment we are going to be there in uh, uh, in person. Um, so you know, watch out for our social media for anything that we may put out there, stuff on iLily or on the, the just regular tweets that we're going to be sending out for, during the game. So, um, but yeah, if you want to uh, suggest anything for future episodes, you can do so by. Uh, Sending uh, Cliffy or myself a, uh, a message on uh, Twitter. Um, we're, we'll always be glad to have, uh, have ideas on what to do. And uh, yeah, so, and it's, it's all about you guys. So it's all, all, all that we can say. So, um, but other than that, uh, again, thanks to, uh, uh, thanks to everybody who joined this week. Thanks to David Arsenault for joining us on the pod. It's great to have him on. Uh, and Cliff, I will talk to you very shortly. Obviously, I will be sitting next to you very shortly too very very soon so yes sir yes sir so so everybody here at the yellow flight deck for cliffy d i'm tim capper run final approach